I heard a, a song last night on the radio. It was aired on a Christian radio station. Uh, the, the depth of the, the song or you know, the meaning that was underlined was about the birth of Christ. And it said that we know that Jesus was born December 25th. That was one line. And I thought, I'm going to get up and shout at that radio and say, He was not born December 25th. Because they go through the whole months. He, we know he wasn't born in January, February, March, April. And then get down to December. But we know that he was born. He said, no, he wasn't born December 25th. That is the month that we celebrate right. of his birth. Uh, I would choose to more correctly say that he was born in eight, the month of April. But, uh, you know, it doesn't matter the day, the month, the hour, or the minute that he was born. The importance is that he was born. And then the purpose of the importance of his birth was what? For redemption. That I, as a sinner, might be saved. Uh, Jesus came to put away sin. And the very purpose of Christ's coming was to deal with the sin question. We know that He offered Himself willingly that He might purchase my salvation this morning. And if you're not saved this morning, there's no reason at all in the world that you have to leave the same way you came today because that is the reason why Jesus came. He was born to die. He was born that He might give His life that you and me this morning would have the salvation that we so desperately need. What a provoking thought this morning. You know, today is something like the 11th day of December. And, uh, you know, yet this day, he knew well, who would be here That's right. this day That's right. that would need a touch from him. Yes. He knew this day what you needed. Amen. He knew this day Amen. that Hallelujah. his blood was going to be good enough to touch your life Hallelujah. one more time. That's right. In Hebrews chapter 9 you, and verse 24, you, it says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered the most holy place every year, with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him he will appear a second time Praise apart God. from sin Praise for God. salvation oh hallelujah. hallelujah hallelujah let's lift our hands one more time and let's love the lord hallelujah we love you jesus Jesus, for this Hallelujah. Of your second coming to take us to be with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Mighty God. You may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the Figures, figures, not figurines, not uh, images, not ornaments, but a copy or the copies 
of the true or what is true. But in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. This little word, S-I-N, that looms so big. We are lost until we have experienced the new birth plan of salvation according to Acts chapter 2 and 38. In Acts 2, it says, Repent for the remission of sin. Repent. Notice the word repent. It doesn't mean to feel sorry because you got caught. Right. It doesn't mean to, you have to feel sorry for yourself with sympathy. But the word repent means to turn from. Turn around. Amen. The, the word repent is to change. Yes. yes. Amen. Direction, basically. Praise the Lord. You're going to the right, and now you're going to the left. You were going wrong, and now you're going right. And this word itself tells us that we must be sorry and then turn away from sin before we can approach the Holy God. And that, that's why it was so important when Peter began to preach his first message to repent of your sin. You know, each one of us was born a sinner. We were all born with a sin nature. And we can't separate that sin nature from us and we can't take out that sin from us. Right. It's part of our DNA. But I'm so glad to know this morning that there's a God. Right. He's you. able to wash that sin Thank you, Jesus. out of our life today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we must be willing to find a place of repentance. We must make it our own on our own volition to kneel at an altar and cry out to God and say, God, That's right. I'm a sinner. That's right. Amen. Amen. You know, it's easy to be like a Pharisee and say, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. It's everybody else. It's like the mother who was staying at the uh, the day of the uh, parade, watching all those soldiers uh, march by, and then she sees her son. She nudges the guy next to him and says, "Look at that! Everybody else is out of step. My son is the only one that's in step. Look at that!" <laughs> of course, he probably felt like nudging her back and say, "Excuse me, ma'am, he's out of step." But that's what we want to feel like. Oh, everybody else is wrong. I'm right. There's nothing wrong with me. Think about the Pharisee uh, who stood in the, the temple with his hands lifted and he had his nice garment on and said, Oh God, I thank you that I'm not like. And he notices a publican that's kneeling down, beating on his chest and say, God, forgive me a sinner. And yet the Pharisee was so willingly boasting, I'm glad I'm not like that sinner. I'm glad there's no sin. We all have sin. The Bible makes it clear that we must come to Him and acknowledge our sin. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes. Isaiah the Old Testament prophet says we all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him. Talking about a prophetic word of Jesus Christ. Laid on him the iniquity of us all. Oh hallelujah. When Jesus came into the world as a babe. He took on the sin nature. And he was made without sin. Yes. But he came into the world yes. with a sin nature. That he took on the sin of the world. Thank you, to be sin for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That prophecy was concerning the coming of Messiah. I think how you and I fit into this picture this morning. 
You see, the angel told him, Joseph, be not afraid to take Mary for your wife. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 says, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. That's right. What is sin? Whatever happened to sin? You know, here we are reminded that Jesus came to save people like you and me from sin. Right. You know, sometimes we look around and, and we see a world that we're living in and where people, and it, it creeps into the church where preachers don't even preach about sin because they say there is no sin. Hmm. But sometimes we've got to look at sin. And look deep and let it in, put a nice impression upon our thoughts. That's right. Even when we have been baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of our sins. Even taking one step further back. When we've uh, confessed our sin. If we didn't have a sin to confess, why did we make a confession? Did we make it just to please someone? No, it's because there's sin. You know, some of us may have never done any great, horrible sin. But every sin is a sin. If you walked into a grocery store when you were five years old and, and snuck a piece of, at that time, maybe a one-cent candy, a piece of chewing gum, or maybe uh, you've gone through the grocery store as an older person and saw some grapes and it's like, oh wow, those are, and just not checking around, see if anybody's looking, pull off a grape, pop in your mouth. What'd you do? Did you pay for the grape? No, you sin by stealing. Now, now they, they, they said there's a store in Peoria that's legal now, that you go in there and they have fruit and stuff out that you can taste. I've never been there. I ought to go when I'm really hungry and I'm saying, I'm here to taste what you have displayed. But you know, we see that this suggests that there's apparently one or two directions that a person can go. Either they're lost or they're saved. Either they're sinful or they're righteous. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes. So where did sin come from? Mm -hmm. When did sin happen? Mm -hmm. Well, if you go back to the book of beginnings, you'll see that God created a perfect world and a perfect universe and a perfect place. He made man. A perfect being. Right. Then a few days later, he makes a perfect woman in a perfect world, in a perfect garden, in a perfect universe. Now everything's going along perfectly. But see, we don't, we don't know about what the incident that happened at that before that time. But Isaiah does give us insight that there was a little disturbance in heaven and. And uh, the Satan and one third of the, uh, the angels was kicked out of heaven. And so guess what? Their, their presence is somewhere in the universe. But God tells Adam, they have the rain and the rule of the whole garden. When he makes Eve, he tells her that she has the rain and the rule of the whole garden. Corporately. Between the two of them, he says, now wait a minute, I, I need to give you instructions. There's one tree. Don't go near. Now that was the first instructions. Don't go near. Second instructions was, don't touch the leaves or the fruit. The third instruction was pretty clear. Don't eat. I think all three of those instructions were pretty clear. Don't go near. Don't even touch the tree. And don't 
eat the fruit. Well, I'm not sure how many days would pass by and they probably saw the tree off in the distance. But on this particular day, Eve got close enough to really view the tree. And while she was there, standing close to the tree, this little serpent, whether he was hanging from a part of the branches from the tree, he begins to speak to her. Oh, isn't this beautiful? Well, why don't you eat it? Why don't you? Here, here. Uh, of course, we know that snakes, they don't have hands and feet. Then they crawl around on their belly. Now, I, I saw in a uh, child's uh, Sunday school literature when, once upon a time that the snake that was in this tree had little feet on it. So, I don't know. Somebody's imagination. But uh, he enticed her to pick the tree now, pick the fruit off the tree. Now, it doesn't say that in Genesis writing. But somehow or another, she got looking at the, the, uh, the fruit, had it in her hand, and then he says, now take a bite. Just take a bite. See if it's good. Mm -hmm. So we see that uh, the Bible teaches us that Adam and Eve failed right. God. That's right. They thrust the whole human race into an atmosphere of sin. Oh, God. But God, in His infinite mercy, has worked until this day to provide a means whereby man could be restored to that fellowship with his maker. Yes, God was in Christ reconciling the world to man, mankind to himself. And our text says that Jesus appeared to put away sin. Yes, amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us yes. who knew no sin, yes. that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. amen. Notice how many times in these few moments we have heard the word sin. So we can see how amazingly clear it is that God hates sin. Right. When we saw Jesus during the time of his ministry, it, it was very clear during his time on earth that he hated sin, but he did not hate the sinner. And we need to make that distinction this morning. We need to hate sin. We need to run from right. sin. We need to right. flee from sin. That's right. Amen. But we, may, we must never, never run from the sinner. That's right. No, we don't have to embrace what they do. We don't have to embrace what they partake, uh, participate in. But we need to show them that Jesus came. He died yes. for you. their Sin. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Whatever happened to sin? This tiny three-letter word that is so rapidly disappearing from the very common vocabulary of our everyday life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about it in that way? How it's gradually disappearing. Right. But yet the dictionary says according to Webster, that sin is transgression of the laws of God. Uh -huh. uh, dis disobedient to the divine will, moral nature. Sin is failure to realize in conduct and character the moral ideal as fully as possible understanding existing circumstances. Failure to do as one ought towards one's fellow man. Right. See, the Bible says that Eve was deceived and Adam is the one that disobeyed. Right. So we see that sin is an act of disobeying. Or disobeying. The act of disobedience. And every act has a consequence That's to right. it. Amen. We've already seen this morning in Romans the consequences of sin is death. Amen. So why not confess 
that sin today and die out to sin oh, that we might have life. Yes. Hallelujah. There's a consequence yes. to that as well. Because Jesus Christ, He came to give us eternal oh, yes, life. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, how easy. Oh, how easy. Oh, you know, we, we can look at, we, we can name all kinds of sin, biblical, and then people like to add other things as far as sin to their list. But see, while the definition is intended to be kind of broad enough to meet both those who are believers and non-believers, you know, as Christians, we're transgressing the law of God. Well, to a non-believer, what's the law of God? So we try to uh, make the definition so it's uh, suitable for them to realize that their shortcomings and their failures, moral ideas will fit into that definition as well. But uh, it fails to say why transgression and disobedience are regarded as bad. Why sin is a no-no. Right. You know, sin becomes a shortcoming. Do you, do you realize how shortcoming it is? If we have unrepented sin, it, sh it sells us cheaply short of having eternal life. Right. Right. If there's sin in our life, we know that heaven is a sinless place and sin will never enter there. And if we have sin, it keeps us out of heaven. That's right. See how sin will cheat us? People can say they can have a, a good time, enjoying life. And there's nothing wrong with having a good time, enjoying life. It just depends on how you in, take your good time and you enjoy your life. Some people use drugs and alcohol as a means to uh, enjoy life and have a good time. But think about how drugs and alcohol have cheated people of their life. Early death. Right. People are having a good time and, and, and wanting to en just enjoy themselves get caught up into something they shouldn't have been, and have died a short life, cheated. And yet, we know that uh, Jesus said to the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, and those who were standing around to him were saying, you, you know what? You, you've got to stone her. That's what the law says. But isn't it amazing how he took the law and turned it towards this woman's accusers? Because these guys that were standing around sitting, even though they were standing in a place of judgment, standing in a place of scorn, they were staying there thinking that they had no blood on their hands, so they are, they are guilt-free. So Jesus, according to the law, she needs to be stoned. And then Jesus does something miraculous. He begins to write in the sand or doodle in the sand. We don't know what he did in the sand. Maybe he was just drawing pictures. Stick men, stick women. Or perhaps he began to take his finger and begin to pin the sin, just a sin, of each one of those accusers. Or maybe he just started writing their names and they begin to disappear. Because when you see your name begin to appear in the sand, it's like, oh, now what's he going to, what does he have on me? Uh, I didn't know he had, you know, a, a, a rap sheet on me. I didn't know anybody was keeping track. I, I didn't know. So before they had an opportunity to have their sin exposed, one by one they began to, begin to disappear. Right. And Jesus looked at her and said, uh, where are your accusers? Where's any man that's going to accuse you? He said, neither do I. I'm not going to condemn you, Praise but I'm going to set you Praise free. The Praise the Lord. Someone that was guilty of death, 
uh, sentence, someone who was guilty for a sin, someone that was guilty of a crime that deserved the punishment. But Jesus said, I'm going to set you free. Um, um, yes, the Old Testament scripture says, let him without sin cast the first stone. Mm -hmm. Yes, a, a sin such as this was uh, com commanded under the Old Testament law to be to condemn to death by stoning. But it was both parties and not just one. And yet, Jesus said, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Satan is having a heyday by causing this little word to be hidden from the minds of people today. Now, I'm going to close here in just a, just a few minutes. But sin is transgression. This simply means by going beyond the known boundaries. This is where most everyone fits today. We know right and wrong. We, we know if we're telling a lie. We know whether we're stealing or if we're being dishonest. And we, we know that the, the Bible says, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. We know that we ought to be loving the Lord our God. And there's only one God. And yes. Him alone should we be serving. Hallelujah. Iniquity means lawlessness. In other words, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. That there are people that uh, they, they'll seek godly counsel, and this is iniquity. But they seek godly counsel, uh, and this is what I really want to do. And, but I, I just need to know if I should do it or not. And, and they're sitting there getting the counseling, and. The pastor or the person they're talking to says, no, that is really not wise. No, or they'll be very direct and say, no, don't do it. Right. They, they really didn't come in there for counseling because in their heart, they had already made to their mind, they're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Iniquity is sin. That's right. Iniquity separates us from God. That's right. That's right. You know, in the Old Testament, there is a time that there was a group of people. They had already, they've already made a decision what they were going to do. They fasted. They prayed to God. Oh, God, we want your will. We, we want, want the right thing. You know what? God says, go ahead, go ahead and do it. He gave them permission. But you know why? Not because it was his will. But he knew their heart. And he knew that they was not going to listen to wise counsel. They were not going to take instructions from righteousness. And they ended up with their punishments. And yet, yeah, but God... Why did you allow them to do this? Because it was set That's in their heart to do right. wrong. That's right. You know, the man of God, that woman of God that is, is desiring to uh, do what is right, but if they have their heart set to do wrong, it's sin. That's right. Amen. And sin separates from God. Amen. Sin is the act or failing on purpose to do right. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's like, it's not given a second thought. You know, well, I know there's a sin, but I'm going to do it anyway. I, I, I'm going to enjoy myself. You know, I, I've, I've heard people say, well, I'm going to go out here and you know, have a good time and I'm going to go to this party. I'm, I'm going to just live it up because I know I can get to church on Sunday and I can pray through. I can repent. But you know what? What happens if you don't make it from that party to find an altar? What happens?
happens if something disrupts and you're not able? The Bible says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And then the fourth one is guile. This is deceit that rationalizes or says it's no worse than anyone else, whatever anyone else is doing. That, that's the kind of the pharisaical version of, you know, but I'm glad I'm not like him. Uh, I'm holy, you know. I, I go to church every Sunday. I pay my tithes and, and, and I, you know, observe the Sabbath. I keep it holy. The other day I was talking to a gentleman just to kind of mess with his mind. He asked me about Sabbath worship. And his Sabbath worship is, you know, the day of rest. You know, we look at not Saturday worship, but Sunday. And I said, uh, you only worship just once, one day? Oh, yeah, you know, that's the day of rest. And that's what the Bible says. I said, um, what about every day of the Sabbath? And he stopped and looked at me. I said, yeah. Aren't we living in a perpetual Sabbath? No, 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 no. S -s -s you know, the seventh day. Rest, day of rest. God worked six days and, and he rested the seventh. I said, yes. But what about keeping every day holy? And then begin to kind of sink in what I was doing with it, you know. It's, well, yeah. But you know, there are some people that only want to be holy just on because it's Sunday or because it's Saturday. What about a living holy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and not just on Sunday? What about telling the truth seven days a week, 24 hours a day if you're awake that long? Yo, what, what's, what's so right about deceiving? Yo, well, I'm not lying. I'm just not telling the whole truth. You know, people want to talk about a little white sin, a white lie. But see, in the Word, it doesn't say anything about whether our lies are red, white, blue, black, green, yellow, purple, polka dotted. It says that all are lies. And every lie separates an individual from God. You know, that, that's why saints is very important. And I'll use this little example, and I'll probably be meddling, but that's all right. You, you know, you can deal with it and get over it and pray through and repent, and, and I'll bless you for it. <laughs> you know, we, we, we talk about not, you know, having no God. That, that means no deceit. Right. Be honest, be upfront. Yes. And, you know, people. Say, you know, they don't say they're sick, but they just don't feel well. Oh, I, I don't feel well, so I, I, I won't be at church tonight. And uh, then they are seen at the mall. They go out to eat. They go here or there. You know, there's a lot of times that I don't feel well. But it's just because I want, don't want to do something. But, you know, it's, it's all right to say, look, you know, I told you I'd be there on Saturday, but I changed my mind. I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to do it. Instead of leading someone to believe that, you know, you're not quite whole. But in our hour of deceit, you know, it can separate us from God. Our philosophy of religion will determine what we will do about God. The way we believe in, and how we uh, review, uh, view our relationship with Christ right. will affect our soul eternally. Right. Oh, I'm so glad to know this morning that Christ is coming yes. back yes. for a church that is holy, oh. that is righteous, Hallelujah. that is without sin, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. and that is without 
our guilt. Thank you, Lord. But the only way that happens is if we will live under the blood. Yes, amen. Oh, hallelujah. We've got to be plunged into the blood every day. see them. I don't see what I'm looking for. But seek is to be diligent enough not to stop until you find what you're looking for. Right. right. Amen. And in closing, the, the woman that lost the coin, she knew that she had to find that coin. She had ten. Lost one. So what? I got nine, but that did not make her whole. She needed that tenth coin to be a whole person. You know why? That one coin meant whether she was going to have a husband that night or she's going to be out on the street. Right. That's why it was important for her. When she got up, she lit a candle and diligence took place. She lit a candle. She moved all the furniture out of the house. I, it doesn't say it in the word, but this is my mind this morning. She moved all the furniture out of the house. She got a broom. She began to sweep every corner. And when she found it, she went through the neighborhood and was screaming and hollering and saying, Rejoice with me for that one that, that the loss is now found. Yes. Right. Hallelujah. Diligence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the shepherd that had 99 sheep lost one. Well, I've got 99. So what? Did these uh, sheep... Uh, they're going to uh, produce and I'll have some more to replace the one. No, he knew that 99 was safe. And he went out to the hillside. Right. This is diligent. Yes. We know what the weather's been like the last couple days. Oh, well, it's warm here. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wait till it warms up and now we'll find it. No, diligence took him out in the evening when it was cool. Because he knew that there was one lamb out there that was going to die if he didn't get out there. Whether he died because of the weather or whether he died because of some uh, ravaged animal torn apart. And he was willing to find it. And when he found it, he picked it up and took it back where it was safe. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. The son, who was the prodigal, he went away from a home. Enjoy his good time. But you talk about diligence Hallelujah. comes to surface yes. when you're sitting in the pig pen Lord. and you're starving. Yes, and all of a sudden that really triggers the mind because all of a sudden he began to think of a home. Thank you, Lord. Home Thank you, Lord. security. Home food. Home clean clothes. Home a nice warm bed. Home comfort, security. All this began to hit him in the face. Amen. Diligence is what got him up. Even though he was hungry, thirsty, mm -hmm. stinking pretty badly. But he was determined, I'm going home because in my father's house, yes. Thank there's you. food. Thank in my father's house, Thank you, Lord. my Thank servants you, Lord. are treated Lord. better. Yes. They're treated like family. In my father's house. Diligence. That's what's going to determine our relationship with God and what we're going to do about our soul. And how determined are we with diligence to say, I'm turning my back on the world. Let's all stand this morning. Oh, hallelujah.